Right, let's move on to the next question, which I have about sort of the, the management aspect of your job. I mean, you're, you, you spent a long time as a staffer in the district, right? And then, so you have a lot of experience as a staffer and then also now, you know, a number of terms as a congressman. You know, how do you manage your team? How do you leverage them? How do you measure their performance? Well, number one, I hire the best people uh, and I give them the autonomy to make decisions. I tell my a top leadership in my office and, and on my committee that if I become the conflict resolution department, then I made a mistake in hiring you guys because you're going to be the ones bringing me some suggestions. But if I have to, if I have to resolve conflicts between personnel in the office, then you're not doing your job. So I have an approach that I learned from my boss, John Shimkus. As a former staffer, many staffers will come into Congress. And as John Boehner warned me at the time, you're going to become a damn micromanager is what he told me. And early on, he was worried I was going to do that. But then in the end, he, he actually said, you know what, you've listened to me well and have allowed your team to do their job. And really, that's what allowed me to put myself in a position to be able to run for Congress because I was given so much flexibility and opportunity to do my job on behalf of John Shimkus for 16 years that when I decided to run for office, I had Democrat elected officials calling me and saying, what can I do? You were always here because he allowed me to do my job to the best of my ability on his behalf. And when, when I'm able to do that, I always am able to remind those officials I work with that I wouldn't have been, been there to help them without John Shimkus believing in me. So it in turn, it helps him. And my staff is the exact same way. I know that, I know that they're going to do everything to the best of their abilities. And when they do a good job and they have the flexibility to make those decisions, then it's going to make me look good politically too. And is there anything specific like for the legislative end of things, like your legislative director, chief of staff, you know, the, the, the groups that are more involved directly in the legislation, you know, I think it's a pretty unique kind of job and how to manage that, that role is, must be pretty unique in, in society. How do you measure that role uh, have reviews, talk about performance? Well, what I do is I allow my, my top staffers, both in the district and in DC and, and on my committee staff, to really do the review process, to really manage their employees that are under them. Uh, that's the approach that I think works best. It leads to less conflict resolution, and it allows them to have some authority over what, the, what our agenda is. Uh, they help then lead lead us to what our goals are, what did they entail, what are, how are we doing to fulfill our mission statement? And then they have some accountability over the personnel that they hire. So in, in my case, um, all of the HR decisions, personnel decisions, I, I, am a, I am a signatory, but I'm also one to say, show me and tell me why this decision needs to be made. It's believing in them. There are some members of Congress that micromanage every aspect of their office and their day. And that is something that I have tried to shy away from. It allows me to concentrate on meeting with constituents, allows me to concentrate on the political side of my job, but it also allows me to, to sit back and think at the 30,000 foot level about what's going to best impact my constituents positively. Right, so you're really a fan of the delegation uh, and autonomy of the staff to a certain extent. Absolutely, I am. I want them to tell me how best to do my job when it comes to their issue areas of expertise. Right. Well, let's move on to another question um, that I've asked a number of scholars and I'm comparing answers. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, this one's about representation and there's different, you know, views of about what, re what representation means uh, in a congressional context. So as, a mem as someone who is a representative, uh, how do you define what representation should mean for, con for, for congressmen? Uh, to me, what representation means is you've got to do your job and be the voice of your constituents, but at the same time, be willing to accept something that's not so perfect, but helps your constituents at a level that you can go back and explain to them why it was good for them and good for the country. Because every decision we make in Washington doesn't just affect our district, it affects the entire country. 
and so I think I got to run. I got to go vote again. I apologize. No problem. <clears throat> Here as votes aye. Mr. Rodney Davis of Illinois. Davis from Illinois votes aye. Mr. Rodney Davis of Illinois votes aye. So I guess my question about representation, maybe if I can ask you a little bit harder part of that question, which is how do you how do you represent the minority views in your district on the one side and also think about the future constituents on the other? You know, we talked about the, you know, the influx of people over time to the district. You know, how do you consider their longer term views, even though they're not around today to vote or to have a voice? Well, here's the problem. Uh, we're policymakers. We can only address what's in front of us today with an eye on the future, which is why a lot of the legislative success I've had are going to impact those new residents coming into my district. I, I mentioned our student loan repayment bill that allows all employers to be incentivized to pay down student debt for their employees. That was under that was because I knew I had 100,000 new students coming into my district every four years. And what do they leave with? They leave with debt, hopefully a great degree too, but they leave with some debt. So th that piece of legislation in particular was looking ahead at what future generations are going to have to deal with when it comes to student debt. But in the end, in the end, we can only address the issues that are presented to us on a daily basis. And we have to take a yes or a no vote based upon the impact now and into the future for our constituents. Um, there are going to be people in my district that are never going to support me. They are never going to like what I, I do. But I've been there many a times when some of the loudest voices of opposition have said, oh, I like when you voted this way on this bill. But they're never going to vote for me anyway, because they're always going to find another reason that makes them a partisan Democrat. So I've got to make sure we don't sacrifice our base, but at the same time, work those undecided independent voters and the issues that are important to them. And if you, if in my opinion, because I rank the 13th most Republican or 13th most, 13th most bipartisan member of Congress, I mean, that to me shows that I'm focusing on legislating rather than just on partisanship. Right, next question is, um, how should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? I know you've talked about this in the Modernization Committee, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, they should give me more debate time because it's fun. Uh, and we try to make it fun while we're down there, make my colleagues laugh and joy and uh, joke around a little bit because Congress can be really, really stuffy. Uh, but I think it's all based upon timing. And I mean, there can be a, a there can be chances when there's too much debate time on the floor and and it just becomes redundant. Uh, but in the end, give everybody a chance to have a voice. Uh, sometimes in hearings, five minutes not enough, and sometimes in hearings, in committee hearings, uh, it takes too long to get to your questions. Uh, but finding that balance between floor time and 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 uh, committee time, I think, is essential. And I I just haven't seen that magic mix yet. Of making that happen. I'm think, all for offering people more opportunities to speak, but at the same time, my recommendations would be cut down on the committee witnesses, allow members to ask longer, have a longer time period to ask questions. I mean, there's no reason you need eight witnesses at a TNI hearing, because by the time they're done giving their opening statements, you're already in, in the, the chair and the rank are giving open statements and the chair and the rank of the subcommittee giving open statements. I mean, you're two hours in. And if you're in the middle of the bias or you're a freshman, that means you got to dedicate four hours to that committee. So figure out a way to make it a little more, a little more time sensitive for your members. I used to do that with, um, I used to do that with uh, a subcommittee that I ran. I would say, look, I'm going to give you my opening statement. I'm going to let the witnesses give their opening statement. We had minimal witnesses, and we would all. I would also wait to ask my questions till the end. Because I knew I had to sit there the whole time. So why am I going to take five minutes at the beginning to ask my questions? I control the time. So that's, that to me is respecting your, your fellow members too. Um, and I think that's essential. So my question is around, you know, talking with your colleagues, right? Discussing, debating. Um, that can be done in a committee setting. It can be done with cameras on. It can be done in a, you know, with cameras off in a more collegial atmosphere where there's not that kind of pressure. Do you feel like that would make a difference in terms of getting to bipartisan or 
more optimal outcomes? Uh, no, because in the, today's day and age, everybody's got a camera. There's never going to be a time when the cameras are off. And unfortunately, I think, um, you know, the 24-hour news cycle in social media is stuck in a gotcha game and a cancel culture game to where um, it becomes more about playing gotcha games with politicians and what they say rather than listening to their entire argument or listening to their entire interview for that matter. So you think even the trans, there's no hope to go back to some kind of a non-transparent way for discussion to happen or privacy among a committee or even on the floor? No, no, uh, unfortunately not. Uh, and, and really there's gotta be equal treatment within the 24 hour news cycle and with social media giants that we don't see right now. Uh, I mean, in reality, there's been no more of a transparent president than Donald J. Trump, but that transparency led to more criticisms. And that is something that I've learned too in Congress that, you know, you want to do what you can to answer reporters' questions and respond to the social media. But in the end, uh, if somebody has an agenda that they want to play gotcha games, then, you know, they're going to pick something out that you said and try and make it an issue. And without giving the entire context. So what's that mean? Is it better than not to be as open? Is it better than not to respond to everyone who walks up and asks you a question from the media? Um, those are decisions that we as members have to make every day. Got it. Uh, next question is, and I think you may have brought this up earlier, but what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within a 50 year time frame? I gotta go get on this end. Mr. Rodney Davis of Illinois. Davis, Illinois votes aye. Mr. Davis, Rodney Davis of Illinois votes aye. All right, 50 years. 50 Go ahead years. Give, give me the abbreviated question again, I apologize. Sure, what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Hmm, that's an interesting question. You're not used to thinking long-term. Yeah, I would say to uh, minimize the remote hearings and remote voting. Um, oh, actually the biggest fundamental change is to take away proxy voting that was just approved by the Democrats for this pandemic. It's led to less personalization and more polarization. That would be the single best thing that we could do to make Congress work better in the next 50 years. So it sounds like for you, the, a fundamental thing is this face-to-face -face interaction with your colleagues, right? Whether it's on the floor or whether it's in committee, even if, even if the cameras are on. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? What is it about the face-to-face -face discussions that is a positive? I mean, I, I can understand it from a human nature point of view, but I'm curious from your point of view, having been engaged so long, why is this face-to-face -face interaction so important? Because it allows you to get to know people other than the political caricature that they become in the news media. You find common ground. I mean, you, you'd be surprised that, you know, some of the folks that I consider very close friends, if, if Fox News heard I was close friends with them or MSNBC heard that they were close friends with me, they would want to excommunicate us. But you find that, you know, we agree probably on 98, 99% of the issues, but the only thing you see on TV and social media is people fighting because it's entertainment value. And I can tell you time and time again of where I've worked with individuals who, uh, who become political caricatures on the, partisan, uh, on the partisan news shows in the 24 hour news cycle. But in the end, you know, we find common ground on issues like flood insurance. We kind of find common ground on issues uh, relating to uh, college debt. Those types of issues can only be, be uh, achieved by getting to know people on a personal level rather than over the phone or, or only through the media or social media. And so do you support a lot more of things like retreats or other er ways for people to get to know each other outside of what would typically be the political theater? I do, I do. Um, but retreats are, are, are too, they're too structured. I mean, it doesn't allow you the time to get uh, to get to know your your colleagues because you're sitting in in you know presentations and panels all day and when you get out you got to do your job 
So you're on the phone, you're talking to constituents, you're dealing with family issues. So, and then you go into a reception, it's forced fun. Let's get back to voting on the floor where we can walk up to each other, ride the elevator with each other, talk to each other. That matters more. I, I'm not a, I, I'm a fan of retreats, but they're not the panacea. Great. My last question is uh, your priorities for the coming year. What do you, what are your priorities? What are you working on? What do you want to try to get done with, with what well, you've Well, my got? priorities are infrastructure investment. Uh, I'm the ranking member of the Highways and Transit Subcommittee, largest subcommittee in Congress. And I want to see us reauthorize the highway program to rebuild our crumbling roads and bridges. I want to do my job and, and conduct effective oversight over the last farm bill on my House Ag Committee that I was able to write. I've been able to help write two farm bills, and I want to make sure we, we put policy, policies in place that are working. Uh, but I think the committee that's taken up most of my time is the House Administration Committee that I lead for our side, and it's going to be getting the House back to normal operations, getting people to be able to come visit the Capitol, getting constituents back into our offices to, to relay their concerns. That, to me, is the top priority. And plus, it goes together with what we talked about throughout this entire call. It's um, bringing people together and, and also making Congress work better. Hey, Representative Davis, thank you so much for your time. Much appreciated. Hey, great to see you. Thanks for having me on.